My guest today has been called the master of thrillers. His very first book was dubbed by Barnes & Noble as one of the best political thrillers ever. That was back in 2002. For 17 straight years, he's released a book every single year. And to read one of his books, it's, like, it's, it's really like looking into a time machine. It's giving you a sneak peek of what is coming. If, if you read his books, it's as if you're getting copies of major, every major uh, world newspaper a full year before it was published. Uh, he's a fascinating guy. The question on my mind right now is, with his new book out, how does an author who has never attempted writing before succeed in writing one of the best political thrillers of our generation on his first try and then follow that up every single year for 17 straight years with another bestseller? If you've read his latest book, it might provide some answers. It might not. Brad and I are friends. I've never had this conversation before, but reading Backlash... It follows his main character as he's forced to use all of his past experiences and training and sheer determination to survive. It's part spy novel, part survival manual. And like this character, uh, he had to draw on everything he knew for the ultimate test. I'm wondering if that isn't exactly what Brad Thor does. My guest today, does he? did he endure a a crucible of his own to create the author that we know today. On today's episode, this author, like you've never heard him before, the master of thrillers. I have to convince Brad Thor to come with me on our cruise through history. When they asked me to do it, I got really excited because I wanted to build an amazing experience for my family and you. I mean, this is something that I really wanted to do with my kids. All my kids are coming with me. I hope your kids could come with you as well. Um, I wanted to really show them the places and then show them why this place, why this time period mattered. Seeing the birthplace of the Republic, seeing the birthplace of com uh, commerce, seeing the uh, birthplace of our faith. Those things are so important because those inspired our founders um, to come up with the idea that man could rule himself uh, and that all men are created equal and create this incredible experiment called America. I want you to come with us. Walk where Jesus and the prophets walked in the Holy Land, Italy, Greece, Croatia. Bill O'Reilly is going to be there. David Barton is going to be there. Rabbi Lappin, Stu, myself, all paired with the amazing amenities uh, of this cruise, a fantastic way to make it a lifetime adventure and a memory that will last the rest of your family's life. It's all-inclusive, which means all airfare, all gratuities, everything. That comes out to about $360 a day. That is a really good deal for what you're going to see. You just need to put down the deposit and you can pay over time, and they're still offering the early bird discount of 400 bucks. So cabins are going fast. Check it out now. Visit Cruise Through History. Come with us. 3,000 people just like you. Come sail away and learn. ComeSailAway.com This is a different book than what you've written before what's changed what's, what's <laughs> happened it, it's hard to it's hard to put my finger on it i turned in last summer's book spy master with an ending that my editor didn't like and she said you need something bigger for the end so uh <laughs> i went back to my office and i said okay give give the reader something bigger and i put in a big cliffhanger i had a character yell to scott harvath my protagonist run he had just stepped outside, and this woman yells, run. And that's where we ended it. Okay, now, wait. 
When you did that, yeah. were you just like, I'll come up with yeah, I'll, something? Yeah, we'll fix, it, no we'll fix it in post. <laughs> I'll do something next year. Yeah, right. And there were a million possibilities. It could right. have been a team was coming in to kill him, and then mm-hmm. the cavalry got that team. for. Right. I didn't know what it was going to be until this year, and I started talking with my editor, and I said, you know, she asked me a lot of really good questions about what do I like in my reading and also my television viewing. What What is good storytelling, period, to me? And I talked about some of the shows that I enjoy, uh, Ray Donovan being one of them. Uh, on Showtime, and she said, well, what do you like about that? And I said, well, the protagonist never catches an easy break, and nobody is safe. You don't know that this character is going to be there uh, the next show. And she said, okay, we'll play with that and see what you come up with. And that started leading me down the road to Backlash, the current thriller. This is getting uh, rave review. You always do. Rave review. This has been but this is exceptional. Different. Yeah, this has been. I have heard from people. Uh, the book's been out not not very long, but within 24 hours of the book coming out, people were hitting me up on Facebook and on Twitter saying. I picked it up just to read a couple ch- chapters, and I stayed up all night. And that sounds like a hooky author thing to say, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Oh, you can't put it down. It's a page turner. But I've had more people come out. I've always had people say, oh, I read it in one sitting, my mm-hmm. other books. So many people have come out. I mean, even somebody from your own team mm-hmm. said to me, I best book. Yeah, couldn't couldn't put it down. Couldn't put, he told me. Down, he, yeah. I, and I retweeted him. Mm-hmm. It was one of the most wonderful uh, tweets I've, I've gotten. So, yeah, there's something about this. Uh, it, it's funny because I had a couple of influences that I wanted to weave in there. I've always been a big fan of the Western, and I like the idea of a man with a code, and he is going to abide by that code, even if it's difficult for him personally. Mm-hmm. And I also read a translation in English of the Odyssey, a more recent translation where the person got rid of all the repeats and stuff. And what hooked me on that was a review of that book in the New York Times that said, Men and women leaving for war should read the Iliad because that will tell them what from their civilized lives need to stay, needs to stay behind in civilization. But when you return from war, they need to first read the Odyssey because that will tell them what needs to be left on the battlefield for them mm. to successfully reintegrate into civilization. Mm. So this is a little bit Clint Eastwood, Magnificent Seven with Scott Harvath and also Odysseus in the Odyssey. Where... This book, he's he's taken by the Russians. Mm-hmm. So let me start with a couple of obvious questions. That, leave your audience with something bigger, that would have been unbelievable just a few years ago, that the Russians would come in here mm-hmm. and... Risk an, an act, yeah, right. an act of war, grab of an war, American right. operative on U.S. soil. Right. Did, the, did what happened with the GRU in... England play a role in your thinking? Absolutely. There, so there are a couple of things the Russians have done that played a played a role. One of it, uh, one of them is what the GRU did with the poisoning, but also the other poisoning with the polonium with mm-hmm. the journalists that mm-hmm. they were willing to go into. It, the fact that they would go back into the UK and mm-hmm. commit another assassination mm-hmm. told me they they don't care. They'll do whatever they feel like doing. So that that spooked me. Uh, there was also a story that my guys, some of my guys who have been in Iraq, told me about uh, a Russian diplomat who was kidnapped by a faction in Iraq and the the Russians sent over a special team of intelligence operatives they found a relative of the kidnappers took that person and started like it was in a deli slicing parts of his body off and mailing it dropping it off for the kidnappers and saying okay it's an ear today it's a nose tomorrow if he's not back by midnight of tomorrow you're going to get a leg and they wrap this diplomat in a baby blanket and put him right back uh on the steps of the of a russian facility so they're they have been emboldened they are fearless the fact that uh under george w bush they went into georgia under barack obama they took crimea and I have a lot of concerns that Putin's territorial ambitions are not going to stop. Oh, no. And that's why I did Spymaster, because I was concerned what happens when you have an American population that's tired of going to war. Would the, and, it, and rightly so, I get it. I don't like war. I don't want to go back to war. But with Afghanistan under our belts and still going on, with Iraq, if the Russians came in and tried to take back Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, three three NATO member countries, most Americans can't find on the map. They're not going to. We're go. not going to have the stomach to no. put our people in. But no. it's our it's our it's our duty. Article five in the NATO treaty is an attack on one is an attack on all. And so I had this idea: what would a president be willing to do to prevent that? 
would he be willing to send somebody like my guy, Scott Harvath, over to prevent it from happening? Mm-hmm. So that was last summer's book. And in this summer's book, as you said, the Russians, they've had enough of Scott Harvath. He has ruined so many of their operations that they said, you know what, we're going to get him. We're going to put him in our own version of a black site, ring him out, and then we are going to reserve the honor of putting a bullet between his eyes for the Russian president. So at the end of the book, the Russian president could come in and put a bullet in him, but Harvath thinks otherwise. So you, this is like a survival guide. It is. It is a lot like that. Yeah. Um, and he's ha- he has to take everything he's learned in his whole life and uh, use absolutely everything, all the good, all the bad, everything to be able to survive. I, I told people, uh, well, I-, I make a lot of movie comparisons. One thing I've told people, it's-, it's my 19th novel, but it's like the James Bond franchise. You can go see a James Bond movie. Doesn't mean if- it doesn't matter if you've seen one, none, yeah. you've seen them all. It doesn't matter. You right. can, you can re- pick up any of my books at any point. Mm-hmm. Um, I-, I-, I was telling people, imagine if you had The Predator. Uh, that uh, great science fiction character, and uh, but the batteries on his suit were dead. And you drop him in Russia, and uh, the Russians are chasing him, trying to get mm-hmm. a hold of him. Uh, and that's, I always refer to Scott Harvath as an apex predator, somebody that's at the top of the food chain. Um, but I, I kind of wanted a little bit of Jack London, Call of the Wild. I mm-hmm. wanted to put him in a situation he'd never been in before. And so this idea of the Russians being able to put a bag over his head in the U.S., uh, and drag him back to Russia, but when they're moving him within Russia, uh, the plane goes down, and this is his one chance for escape. And this is something that when we teach uh, uh, what's called SEER school here to our military, it's an acronym for survive, evade, resist, escape. One of the things they're told to be prepared for is you may only get one chance to escape. And when it comes, you have to take it. You've got to make the decision. You've got to be, you've got to be ready ahead of time that if it pre- presents itself, you're going to run with it. Uh, and so that presents itself for Harvath. And so he's not only got the Russians chasing him, but he's in one of the most remote, most isolated, dangerous parts uh, of, of Russia. And it's, it's freezing outside. So I spent time uh, with a a legend in the Navy SEAL community who teaches this stuff, cold weather warfare and survival in Alaska for the SEALs. Uh, And the flip side of it is, I also spent time, uh, I was interested what happens in Washington, D.C. if we lose a high-level spy like this. Mm -hmm. How do we get them back? And I learned that under Barack Obama, when James Foley, the uh, journalist, was taken by ISIS and beheaded, that there were a lot of agencies going well, who's in charge of getting them back? Is it the State Department? Is it the CIA? Mm -hmm. Is it the Defense Department? And in the aftermath of that, Barack Obama put something together called the Hostage Recovery Fusion Cell. And he set it up. It was a State Department program run out of the FBI where they could bring people in from all the agencies. There's a desk for Treasury. There's a desk for the NSA. There's a desk for the CIA, FBI. And they sit them around here so that they all talk to each other and they share information. And they try to figure out how to get the how to get the the American back. And President Trump, I, I think, very wisely chose to keep this program, and he pumped more resources and things into it. Uh, in fact, my book, it's a friend of mine from college that President Trump tapped to be the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs, mm. and I dedicated this book to him. Mm. Because I think what he's doing, uh, helping to free the Christian pastor uh, pastor in Iran, all of these things, he is constantly on planes going around the world trying to get Americans back. And there's a lot of different levers they, they pull on. Uh, but with this book, I took a lot of license. It isn't like the Russians could read this book. They're not going to learn right. how we get our guys <laughs> right. back. It's not going to happen. Um, so let me, let me take it back to somebody who's taking everything in their life and then applying it. Um, because one of the questions I want to talk to you about is how... Scott was born, but mm-hmm. before I get there, how, how, where, what experiences, what tough things in your life, what were the tools of your life that you put together to be able to create what you've done? I mean, this is your 20th book. 19th. 19th, 19th book. yeah. And aren't they, they're all bestsellers, if not all number one bestsellers. Yeah, they haven't all been number ones. They've, uh, they've, we started out by my first book, making it onto a regional bestseller list, and we built from there, uh, ended up then having repeated number ones on the New York yeah. Times list. So I've been very fortunate and have built a wonderful audience. Um, 
I grew up in Chicago. My dad is a no longer active Marine who went to school on the GI Bill and became a real estate developer. My mom was a flight attendant. I always think of the movie Boeing, Boeing with Tony Curtis. Uh, when the jets got introduced to uh, international travel, my mom flew for TWA in the 60s mm. from New York to Paris, Paris, New York. And Boy, in, she had to be beautiful. Oh, she was, that was stunning. Yeah, that was a prerequisite. That was the day, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the little pillbox hat yeah. and the white gloves. Wow. And you had to know how to carve a roast in flight and Jeez. all of this stuff. And it was really neat. Uh, my dad saw the world with the Marine Corps. He was in the Philippines. He was in Japan. My mom saw the world with TWA. I had a uh, travel bug growing up. Uh, it, but the arts in our house were something to make you better rounded. They were not a career path. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going to the University of Southern California. My dad wanted me to study. Stop. Yes. Before we get there. Back up. <laughs> back up. Back I up. jumped too far ahead. Back up. Your folks got divorced. Yes, they did. How much of a role did that play on you? I was always a big reader. And I think my folks got divorced when I was nine. And that was, that it was not, e yeah, it was not easy. Um, so I think I, I became an even bigger reader. I think I retreated into books. And I think that's really where the writing started because my grandmother had encouraged me to right. write down what I was feeling, what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. So it became a way uh, of dealing with, uh, how does a nine-year-old find the words to talk mm -hmm. to adults about why aren't you staying together mm -hmm. and that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'd always loved to read. Uh, my favorite book when you were reading? Uh, as, a, as a kid. At that time, the, the Black Stallion novels. I loved those. Those and the Hardy Boy books I absolutely loved when I was in grade school. Love Hardy Boy books. Yeah, they were great. They were great. Yeah. They were great. Uh, all right, so you start this, you always had read, but now writing is starting with your... It, it, yeah, I started was. writing, So, and I'd known I wanted to write even earlier than that, but it, it started to take off. So we go to my grandmother's house in Wisconsin for weekends, and I'd write plays and things like this and short stories. So it, it almost as if my parents, in that divorce, that opened up something for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it... it, it I turned my attention inward because mm -hmm. my, my world was changing so rapidly mm -hmm. and so in such a difficult way for me as a nine-year-old that I, I turned in and I found this part of my, myself where it, it's where I could control things. I couldn't mm -hmm. control things outside, but any world I was writing about was a world that I was in complete control over. It's fascinating. We have mm -hmm. very similar, I mean, that's really what got me to talk to oh, a wow. microphone. Wow. Um, so you go to a... Is it a high school or junior high school that's very left? It's in Chicago, uh, it's and you're high with school. stars, right? Right. So this was a very progressive liberal arts school. My, uh, my dad was freaking out because he wanted me to continue my Jesuit education in Catholic school because I'd gone Which to a... Jesuit education is not necessarily conservative either no <laughs> yes yeah that's that's very that's very true yeah so he wanted me to go to, to a particular catholic high school and continue that education i didn't i really liked this school francis parker in chicago and uh daryl hannah had come out of there the actress jennifer beals the actress uh, a couple years older than me is billy zane and billy was uh what the phantom and he was in titanic mm -hmm. he's done a ton of stuff and in my class was uh actress ann h uh and uh the Mammoths, Tony and David Mamet had been there. So mm. we had a lot of, and then some of my classmates had been on jailbreak, like Paul Edelstein and uh, just really neat people. And in fact, Adam Shear, who was a, I think Adam's a year younger than I am, now runs Ryan Seacrest Company. He had been mm. at William Morris Endeavor and now runs Ryan Seacrest Company. So that school has turned out a lot of successful people in the entertainment business. Um, I liked it because you go from Catholic school to, pro to a progressive liberal arts school where it's like you don't do your homework, you just get a zero. You don't get the You don't, right. get, the you don't get the ruler. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're there. Did that play a role in shaping your worldview of seeing things differently, being able to relate to more people later in life? Did that play a role in anything? A little bit. The I remember the watchwords above the above the stage were a school should be a complete community, an embryonic democracy, something else. I've forgotten it. I knew it forever. But the the emphasis on personal responsibility I thought was very very interesting. And they said, you know, when you get to college, you don't do your homework, you also get a zero. Mm -hmm. But I think I had the school record for going in front of the disciplinary committee 
uh, committee wow. because I would get I would push on the rules in the handbook because I want them to walk the walk and I won every single time I went to the disciplinary wow. committee based on I said here's what the handbook says I was like a little lawyer I'm sure I I'm sure I annoyed the heck out oh of the teachers gosh. that dragged me in front of that committee but um, it was good I really came into my own because I had people watching on the edges the teachers but they really left you to your own development uh, to a right. certain degree if that makes makes sense so so you're then now let's get to your dad mm -hmm. your dad when it comes time for college he gets to pick he's paying that was part of the divorce thing and i had applied for and college he gets to pick i so i had a girlfriend in st louis so i applied to go to mizzou i thought i'd go into the journalism program there it's fantastic down in missouri in fact i was the first senior in my school to get into college and i didn't even use the college counselor so there's another teacher that didn't like me i was messing with his rice bowl because he gets paid extra yeah. he was the math teacher and he got paid extra to be the college counselor uh, but my dad said no he said listen i'm paying and i want you guys uh you know you'll go out to school in california you're going to work too while you're in school it's not a full float thing so i ended up leasing apartments out there but he was building office buildings and hotels uh in southern california and he really liked the network of people that went to usc uh there's a real reputation that if you're interviewing me and someone else and you went to sc and i went to sc and this person god forbid went to ucla <laughs> or someplace else the, the 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 legend was is that i would get hired because mm -hmm, we have mm -hmm. that in common it's called an old boys club yeah so we, yeah. we call it the cosa nostra of yeah. southern california <laughs> right. but uh, yeah, so I, I went to USC and um, studied business administration because my dad wanted me to get my, uh, get my degree in that and then come out and go into business with him. And I hated it. I hated it. We had, uh, we had an econ class. It was like an introduction to economics and it was Valentine's Day was coming up and we had this teacher that was so excited. Uh, and he was sweating and he said, I got the perfect, we're going to work on this. You've got X amount of flowers, uh, red roses that have been ordered, but not enough vases. And how do we keep the customers? And I closed my books. And my friends were looking at this, what are you doing? I said, I'd rather take a bullet between the <laughs> eyes than be a middle manager in a flower store chain. I'm out of here. And they said, it's just a, you know, it's just an example. You don't have to do this. And I moped in my, in my room for two days, my dorm room, and somebody suggested I go see the college counselor, uh, the career counselor, I should say, at USC. And I took a test, which they've changed the name, but at the time it was called the Strong Campbell Personality Test. Mm -hmm. And I scored off the charts for writing and publishing. And I said, okay, this, I've wanted to do it since I was a little boy. I'm not going to tell my dad. And I went into the, the registrar's office and I said, can I, take, can I switch over to creative writing and film and television production while it still says business administration on my report cards going oh home? Gosh. And they said, yeah, you just, within 24 hours of graduation, you have to declare that major and you better make sure you've taken all the classes. And that's what I did. My dad figured it out well before graduation. <laughs> what uh, was his response? Uh, it was interesting because it was the late 80s, early 90s, and a lot of the bond traders were leaving New York to go out and do financing in Hollywood. And that those stories were making it into the mainstream mm -hmm. business magazines that he read, For Forbes and Fortune, and it was in the Wall Street Journal. So he just said, wow, that's great. You can go into the movie business and get in on the finance side. Maybe we'll do master's at USC in finance. And I was just, as long as I can just graduate without him, you know, trying to steer me, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it then. But he's very proud of what I've done now. Uh, I, I don't think he would have ever said, yeah, that's a great career path. Go do it. But he's very proud of what I've accomplished. But this isn't this isn't when you started. I mean, you didn't start. No. You didn't start writing. No. What did you do when you got out? So I got out and uh, I, I decided to do something. I saved money while I was working at USC, leasing apartments, and I decided I would do something no American had ever done. It's going to be the first. I'm going to move to Paris and write a novel. Oh, that's never happened before. It's like those North Koreans, yeah. always thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Always thinking. All right. So I went, and, uh, I went and got about three chapters into writing a thriller. I didn't know what I was going to write. I sat down and I got three chapters in. And then that voice that we all have in the back of our minds started talking to me saying, this might not be good. This could be embarrassing for you. What if you Ooh. take this time and nobody likes the book? You don't get it published. It's not even worth the risk. Why don't you just ship the laptop back home. You've saved some money. You can travel on a URL pass and stay in hostels. Why don't you see a bit of the world and, you know, put this silly idea to bed. And I gave into that. I gave into it. And so I did some traveling. Uh, I came back to interview with William Morris to go into their agent training program. And it was a bunch of interviews over several months. But while I'd been in Europe, I got an idea for a TV show. I thought traveling made me a better American. 
I realized how lucky we are to live in this country. It's true. It's very true. And I wanted to encourage young Americans to travel while they're young, not when they're retired. Don't wait till you're retired. Mm -hmm. Go now. So I had this idea. I came back. I ended up going to work in my dad's business because his, uh, his assistant had been on a leave of absence, and I knew the business from growing up in it, and I could help him. And he said, here's the deal. I'll let you run your little production company. I was pitching public television on my idea. Um, but I still want you to go and do these interviews with William Morris because I'd like to see you. That'd be a great rocket ship into doing movies. Uh, so I was based in Chicago doing this, and public television bit. They liked the idea of a travel show for young people. And I had <laughs> the day they said yes was the day I had my final interview at William Morris. And the head of the television department at that time was a gentleman by the name of Bob Cristani. I've looked for him ever since. I don't know where he is, if he's even still in the business. But I sat down with him, and we talked, and I told him. PBS bit. They said they're interested in this. And he said, Brad, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. You don't strike me as an agent. You strike me as a creative person. You're the kind of person we would represent here. And he said... I'm going to give you a piece of advice. You decide to take it, not take it. He said, but if you've got a chance to be the writer, the star of your own show on public television, he said, grab it with both hands. Grab it. You'll regret not doing it. It was one of the best pieces of advice I ever got. I did it, and I did 23 episodes, uh, 10 episodes the first season, 13 the next season, uh, and that's, that was Traveling Light, my travel show. It's too bad somebody didn't have an archive to be able to show those embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've still got some. I've still no, got we, some. I just don't travel around with so them. So do we. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, shoot. Uh, okay. So when do you, when do you meet your wife? Uh, so I am home from filming the, uh, the first season. I'm, uh, I had come home. I been working in Europe, but just wrapped the first season of shows. Uh, had a little bit more left to go back and shoot, but I had a I had a plane ticket I had to use, so I came home. I always have a rule: I don't go out the first two nights I'm home because I'm falling asleep with the jet lag, and it's rude, and I, I just can't help it. I hit five o'clock, and my eyes do this. So I'm out having lunch with my with my godfather, and we're out and sitting outdoors in Chicago, and a friend walks by that our family's known forever. And he says to me, he says, hey, Brad, good to see you. Uh, we're throwing a wine tasting party at our house tomorrow night. Would you like to come? We're just inviting a bunch of friends and everything. Uh, and something told me. Some force said, don't say no. You have to go. And this was my number one rule I never broke. And I said, yes, I'll go. And it turned out that this friend of ours, uh, he and his wife were trying to get all their single friends together for a wine test mm. tasting. I walked into this thing. I saw my wife across the room. I, I had been in love with Meg Ryan forever. And that mm. had been my picture of mm -hmm. the perfect woman. And I found better than Meg Ryan. Mm -hmm. And I saw her and I, I just knew that was the woman I was going to marry. And I did. We've been together 23 years now. Wow. She is wonderful. Yeah. Um, and very lucky, too. Oh, very, very lucky. Well, I don't know about that. She uh, says I'm great at right. everything but so, humility. Right. So, <laughs> so you are, she's the reason you are a writer. Yes. Nothing else. You gave up on yourself. I did. And yep. you're on your honeymoon. And she looked at me. We were in a piazza in Italy one night, and she said, what would you regret on your deathbed never having done? That's a good question to ask maybe before you get married. It's a good, yeah. it really tells you a lot about the person you're considering spending your life with. But she asked me there, and I said, writing a book and getting it published. I, I didn't even know I'd said it. It just whoo, came out. And she said, fine, when we get home, you start taking two hours a day, no phone, no, no TV, no internet going in, that you focus on this and you make that dream come true. And that's how I got started writing. So I don't hear a lot of Scott in this story, except for perhaps your dad's experience. Where does Scott come from? So when, you, when you're looking for a character and you need to develop a character, especially one that's run this many books, mm -hmm. you have to know him inside and out. Where did yeah. he come from? It came from people that I knew. So I had a really good friend of my dad's who was in the FBI. Uh, one of my neighbors in college had been part of a top secret U.S. program that placed uh, operatives in Berlin while the wall was still up. 
in case the Russians ever overran the wall. Their job was to create guerrilla warfare. They had hidden weapons caches and radio sets and money all over Berlin. Fascinating group. Um, it, it, but for me, Harvath, I think Bond was part Ian Fleming, just like I think mm-hmm. Jack Ryan was part Clancy, kind of that alter ego. I think Harvath was that for me. Um, he's the ultimate Boy Scout. He's somebody that loves his country. And I, I knew, based on what my parents had taught us growing up, that there is no American dream without those willing to protect it. And so we were, we were raised with a very informed sense of patriotism. We were very appreciative of law enforcement, the military, what the members of the intelligence community do. So I had been steeped in, in those areas growing up, hearing mm-hmm. stories, knowing friends of my parents and things like mm-hmm. this growing up. And I understood what courage and what dedication it took to, to stand on a wall to put yourself into hostile territory. So for me, it was a way of honoring those people. But also Stephen King had said that, uh, number one, a writer is someone who's trained their mind to misbehave, see things differently, think differently, but that you should write what you love to read because that's where your passion is. So as I graduated from the Hardy Boys books, I started picking up my dad's Freddie Forsyth books, the mm. Le Carre books, the Clancy mm-hmm. books, and I couldn't read them fast enough. I loved those books. So I was I was introduced to all of these different characters like Jason Bourne and mm-hmm. Jack Ryan and all of this stuff. So that was really the world that I was living in uh, with books. Let me go back to you. Um, you you've talked about something inside of me said. Um, I just knew, I felt this was, you, you are a divine providence kind of guy. How many days after your wife said, you have to go and write books, was it between that conversation and you on the train with your wife mm-hmm. and somebody sitting across from you? So uh, it was probably, I don't know, a week later. So a week later, uh, it, <laughs> So when I was doing the show for public television, our sponsor was Rail Europe Group, the people that do the rail passes. Mm -hmm. And as a wedding present, they gave us first class passes and Mm -hmm. as many overnight train compartments as we want. And the joke in my family is in addition to being Swedish and Norwegian, we have a little bit of Scottish, so we wouldn't cough up a buck (laughs) if we were choking on it. And it was a great way, and I knew this from running, doing a budget travel TV show, that overnighting on the trains is a great way to spend money. And I thought, oh, get North by Northwest with Cary Grant oh, and the train it. and the mm-hmm. Orient Express. What a romantic thing. Uh, I didn't know my wife gets motion sick. So it mm-hmm. wasn't as romantic as I thought it would be for a honeymoon. But she, you know, we found some drama, I mean, at some point and, and she was good. But our very last overnight was going to be from Munich in Oktoberfest to Amsterdam. That was the only train compartment we, ha- we would have to share and sleep with strangers. And every town we were in throughout Europe on our honeymoon that had a train station, I would walk in and say, have there been any cancellations? Can we get a private on this last leg of our trip? And my wife said eventually, you know, we're spending more time in train stations Mm -hmm. than we are seeing the sights. And you're the one that always says, Brad, everything happens for a reason and it always works out for the best. I said, well, that's what I tell friends of mine when they won't take my advice and they keep repeating this is their problem. And she said, you're fired. No more travel agent. Let's just go and whatever happens, happens. When we boarded the train that late afternoon in Munich for the ride or early evening to Amsterdam, there was a lovely brother and sister from Atlanta, Georgia on board. They recognized me from my TV shows. And uh, the sister and I had this shared love of books. It's one of the things I love about reading. It doesn't matter if you're uh, Democrat, Republican, rich, poor, black, white. If you love books, you have a shared Mm -hmm. love language. Mm -hmm. And we spent um, all night talking about books. Uh, In fact, she introduced me to Vince Flynn. She had Mm. said, oh, there's this great new book, guy named Vince Flynn. It's called uh, Term Limits. You've got to read it. I said, I'll look for it when we get, uh, get near an English bookstore. But anyway, we talk all night. And she said, well, you know, I love your TV show. Are you going to film more episodes? And I said, because I figured if I told my secret again, that it would be easier. I said, well, I'm actually going to write a book when I get home. And she's like, wow, that's really neat. We get off the train. We would get very little sleep that night because we stayed up talking all night. But when we get off on the platform in the morning and we go to change, exchange contact information, she hands me her business card and she's a sales rep for Simon & Schuster. Hmm. And she said, if you write that book, 
and I can help you at Simon & Schuster, let me know. So, so divine providence, God saying, you know, my wife asked me that question and it mm -hmm. just all came together. And as we left the train station, it was pouring down rain. There were no cabs. We had to drag our bags to the hotel. The room was not ready. So they said, go to this cafe around the corner and have a coffee, have a sandwich. When you come back, it'll be all set. We sat down at the table. My wife's like Louis L'Amour, the great Western writer, mm -hmm. in that she always has a book with her and she's always reading something. I found a newspaper and I opened it up. It was an International Herald Tribune. And in it was a story about a Swiss intelligence officer who embezzled all this money from the Swiss government and was training his own shadow militia high in the Alps with high tech weapons from his own private arsenal. That became my first novel, The Lions of Lucerne. So all that stuff happened within like a week on my honeymoon. If I remember right, let me see if I can get the exact quote. Um, the first book that you wrote, I think, was called, I believe by the New York Times, one of the best political thrillers ever. It, uh, I believe it was Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble. Yes, that's Barnes & Noble. One of the, and that's my very first book. Yes. So when you wrote it, uh -huh. here's a guy who was in Paris who stopped writing. Did Stop. you use any of that? No. In Do fact, you still have it? I had lost it. I found it. Four days ago, before leaving on tour, I found those first three chapters. You have I found, to, I've talked you have about them for 20 years. You at least have to put them online. I have to do something yeah. with them, yes. Um, uh, so you, you know, didn't have a lot of self-confidence. Uh, your wife kind of walked you through that. When you submitted it, how were you feeling? Well, I'll tell you what felt fantastic was finishing it. Because when I finished it, I, I sensed this must be what it's like for someone who runs their first marathon, climbs their first mountain. Mm -hmm. No matter what happened to me for the rest of my life, I knew I could do it again. Mm -hmm. And that I would not go to my grave wondering what would my life have looked like had I just sat down and tried. And it felt fantastic. So I submitted it, not knowing what was going to happen. My, my friend Cindy Jackson, the lovely uh, uh, young lady from the train, she read it, made some suggestions. And she was slowly trying to work it through Simon & Schuster because she had one editor in mind for it. And in the meantime, I'm querying agents. I'm trying to get an agent. I'm getting rejection after rejection after rejection. I found one agent that said, I like this, but it needs a little work. And if you'll do X, Y, and Z, I'll read it again. So I said, Okay. And about that time, my friend Cindy called me and said, Emily Bessler at Simon & Schuster, a fantastic editor. You know Emily. Yep, I do. Uh, who was Vince. Still, and still your editor. Still my editor. She was Vince Flynn's editor. Mm -hmm. uh, Emily, Cindy said, Emily Bessler is going to call you. And Emily Bessler called me and said, you've given me the best two days of reading. I, I, I don't know. It's been so long since I've read something I've loved and have been so excited about as the Lions of Lucerne. She said, do you have an agent? And I said, can I call you back in five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> and I called the agent, Heidi Lang, who I have now, and I've had ever since. And I told her the story. And she said, well, I guess you don't need to make my changes then to that mm. manuscript. And it's lovely because uh, I would tell anybody who would listen how much I love my agent, Heidi Lang. And I yeah, would say it in newspaper articles and all that kind of stuff. Dan Brown ended up going over to Heidi and uh, he said, I've got this new book. I want a new agent. And let me tell you what it's all about. And she goes, oh, it's pretty interesting. What are you going to call it? And he says, I think I'm going to call it the Da Vinci Code. Mm. So it's for me, I'm always happy when people who are meant to be together, when, it, yeah. when they come together and good things happen. Yeah. And that's exciting for me. So if you get good reviews, um, it's regional. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we make regional bestseller. Big... Yeah. Is writing what you thought it was going to be? Is the life of a writer, what's it like? What you think it was going yeah. to be like? Oh, you know. I'll tell you what I thought. There was, a, <laughs> there was a great movie with Tom Selleck and Paulina Portskova called Her Alibi. Mm -hmm. He's a writer that has writer's block. So he goes down to the criminal court building, leaves his place in Martha's Vineyard or Connecticut, mm -hmm. goes in. And here's this beautiful woman who's been accused of murder. She doesn't speak English. Uh, but he's got writer's block. And people are bringing him casseroles. His editor's mm -hmm. coming out to help or And his agent and mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. I thought it was very romantic. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the misconceptions I had about Hemingway and all this stuff. Uh, it, it's work. It's hard, but it's hard because of who I am vis-a-vis -vis my parents who told me every day on the job, treat it like it's your first day on the job. Don't ever phone it in. Well, that's why you raise the bar so each time. Uh, it, 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 you'd think it gets easier. It doesn't. It gets harder, 
but I don't work for Simon and Schuster. I work for the readers. Mm -hmm. And when they leave a review online, that's my annual performance review. And I want five stars. I want them to say, your job is safe for another year. You know, we've got you. You're great. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, and do they see all of the sweat and all the tweaks and all the angst and teeth pulling that go into it some, some nights in my office? No, and they're not supposed to. They're supposed to get a great white knuckle thrill ride. And if you close the book a little bit smarter, we've talked for years about faction mm -hmm. where you don't know where the facts end and the fiction begins, mm -hmm. then I've done my job. And that's, that's what I work for is to make people happy, to entertain people. Those are my favorite my favorite books of yours are the ones that I spend with the laptop. Right. Side by side. That yeah, can't be true. Yeah, is yeah. that really true? Yeah. Is that really happening? Which I think you're the, you're the best at. Thank um, you. Do you ever, do you ever, my kids said to me, height of my success, mm -hmm. um, I'm very positive, you know, on everything, you know, as you think it will become. Mm -hmm. But I've said to my kids, uh, ever since we were successful at all, enjoy it while it lasts. Yeah. Because um, nothing is forever. And, and my daughter asked me one time, why do you say that? And I said, well, because I've been through it before. Not at this scale, but I've been through it before. Uh, and it's, success is meaningless. Um, it shouldn't change you. It should, this is just an extra little perk of life. It's what you do and who you are and how you express yourself. That's what means something. Not all of the gifts right. that come with it. And what good can you do with it? What can right. you do outside yourself? How Correct. can you take the blessings that you've enjoyed and make other people's lives better? Not make their lives easier necessarily, but make other people's lives better. Uh, so yeah, I, I talk to my children about this all the time because it's important for but them. Do you, but do you ever sit down and think, I don't know if I have it anymore. I don't know if I, whew, man, I, I. Well, you top your, like I'm, this book. When they said, yeah. when you came back and said, run, uh -huh. did you have any time that you were like, Oh, the whole time. Okay. The whole time. <laughs> okay. I was not in because Scott Harvath, my character, goes through some incredible loss. And I, I, I'm looking for that balance. It's a high wire act. How do I keep this an exciting thriller, but reveal him as a human being? Am I, is he going to keep things completely compartmentalized and be only focused on survival? Or is he going to have these down moments where the horrible things that happened that the Russians did to be able to put a bag over his head, the people he cares about who died, that's got to bleed in at some point. Even if you're trudging through the snow, you've got to say, those people are dead because of me. Mm. They, they're gone, and it's mm. my fault. I couldn't protect them. Somebody who sees himself as a defender of the defenseless. So let me ask you this. Who's your favorite Bond? My you watch Bond? Oh, yeah, I've seen okay. them all, and I've read the books and everything. I, I, in the movies? In the movies. Are you still Are you still watching the Bond series? Oh, yeah. yeah okay. well, I've seen all of the movies, but okay. I keep, I watched the launch for 25 mm -hmm. that they did. My wife surprised me one year with a trip to Ian Fleming's home in Jamaica before wow. we had kids, and I got to sit at Ian Fleming's desk and write. Fascinating. Fascinating. He's a wild guy. A, a, a wild guy, but people don't. He that is him mm -hmm. in many ways. Oh, yeah. That is him. I have yeah. to show you out to, before you leave. I'll take you to uh, our vault. I have an actual Ian Fleming exploding rat from World <gasps> War II from Paris. Wow. It's unbelievable. Wow. He was the guy who said, "Why don't we put? Yeah. Why don't we get real dead rats, fill them with explosives, and when the Germans are." We have to slow down their war machine. Mm -hmm. They're shoveling coal. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, people don't clever know. Guy. He was really clever. Yeah. Really clever. Very devious. So who's your favorite Bond? So I think probably Sean Connery is always going to be my mm -hmm. favorite. I love Sean Connery. Mm -hmm. But I think Daniel Craig and the reboot they did with Daniel Craig was absolutely fantastic. I mean, here's a guy who's 51 years old. He looks fantastic. I know. And he... I got, He's Scott. Yeah. He's Scott. You yeah. see... You, unlike Sean Connery, th there's never a scratch on his outside right, or his inside. Right, yeah. Where Daniel Craig oh, takes his lumps. You see the scars uh -huh. inside as well, yeah. which I think adds such depth to the character. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 
from a writing standpoint, if you study what happened in Casino Royale, how they had that double beat ending where yeah. it ends, yes. he's rescued from getting tortured yeah. and all that kind of stuff, and then he's sailing with Vesper. And then there's that whole other thing and the building collapses on yeah. the Grand Canal in Venice. Yeah. It, it, that, from a writing standpoint, is fantastic, but it, they fantastic. really revealed his inner scars while showing the outer ones as well. The most point. important line in that is, why? The bitch is dead. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when he's coming home yeah. and she's... He's talking to M. M. Yeah. yeah. I remember and that. And you see him just wall up. Cold. Yep. Just wall up. Yep. Um, let's go back to the book now. Okay. Talk a little bit about... Um, e e there's a couple. There's a couple of places. For instance, there's there's um, Scott talks about vengeance and the importance of vengeance, mm -hmm. and I thought that was an interesting word to choose. Can you tell a story a bit without wrecking anything? Yeah, I think I can. Um, I have a big thing about Putin. I do not like Putin. So Putin was on my mind a lot when I was writing this book. And one of the things that I'm most concerned about is when the Soviet Union broke up, a third of their nuclear arsenal was in Ukraine. And we wanted Ukraine to part with it, to get rid of it. We made Ukraine a promise. And we said, you will never be invaded. You will never lose any of your sovereign territory. We guarantee it as the United States of America. And Shameful. They, and they said, Shameful. okay. Get Russia to sign it, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the Russians did. It wasn't even worth the ink on paper. But then under the Obama administration, Putin did it. He sent his, he sent his little green men in there, a lot from what's called the Wagner Group, which is uh, you and I talked on the radio about them. Richard and, Wagner. Yeah, yeah. And so they, uh, this private military corporation. Wait, so, wait. Let's explain that because I think mm -hmm. it's in the book. But I think it's yeah. really, I didn't even know this. I mean, I know... Uh, I know the history of Wagner with uh, Hitler, Hitler. And, and it's a fascinating. So it's like a Russian version of Blackwater. So they take former special operations, uh, Russian military people called Spetsnaz, and they hire them and they come to work for this private company. By the way, these things are illegal in Russia. You're not allowed to have a private military co corporation. This one exists. And this is the one that does Putin's bidding. So as Maduro was starting. Who pays to for it. Uh, they, they, I don't think the money comes directly from the, from the Kremlin. I think they funnel it around so mm -hmm. that there's no direct, but it's, it's the Russians are funding these guys because they're doing all of what Putin once done. They're going these into the Syria, backing up uh, Assad. And these are the guys we killed in that yes. bombing yeah, in that, Syria. Yeah, about 150, and, two, uh, 200 of them. Right. And it yeah. was like no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, uh -huh. The Russians were kind of like, what soldiers killed yeah. what? <laughs> and that's why they exist, to give right. them the plausible deniability. Correct. And as Maduro was starting to topple, these are the guys that went into Venezuela to back him up mm -hmm. and make sure that if there was a military coup, he'd be protected. Um, why are they called the Wagner Group? So they're called the Wagner Group because the colonel who runs them, his call sign in the Russian Special Forces was Wagner. He chose it for himself because they are obsessed with the SS and Nazi ideology, and Wagner was one of Hitler's favorite composers. Mm -hmm. So he chose Wagner as his call sign. He named his company Wagner. And these... Uh, How do you mean he's obsessed and they are obsessed with the SS and they're... There is a... And it's a it's a difficult word for me. I should have written it and had it on a card here. Mm -hmm. But there is a hybrid religion slash cult that grew up around paganism and Nazi ideology at the collapse of the Soviet Union. Do you know... Um, What's his name? Uh, Kurt Lander. Kurt Lander. He's just written a new book. I'll, I'll remind you. It's okay. very scholarly, but it is all on this. And he wanted to write the quintessential um, uh, basic text uh, on the religion of the SS mm -hmm. and the religion of the German people and how, how it came apart. It's not a commercial book. Um, it's really scholarly, but you would love it. I would it is, totally love it. Because it goes into all of that. It's so, fascinating. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's people in Russia. I know that um, the, um, what's his name? The uh, guy who wrote the fourth political theory. Um, he's a Putin advisor. Um, he, is, uh, he is also fascinated. There's, there's a lot of people in the former Soviet Union yeah. that are, they buy into this religious mm -hmm. nightmare. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of kind of 
ethno ideology that can be wrapped into that mm -hmm. and you you see Putin is very even now uh, we, he's been making comments about you know immigration and all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff so, so there's a lot that works for it's them master on that. race stuff it is master race stuff so as an author looking for bad it's guys for stuff. a novel I couldn't it, it, this is I guarantee you this is one of the things that readers will go search and say this group can't be real number one right. and this ideology Thor it's so over the top mm -hmm. and it's real and yeah. people are gonna search it reading mm -hmm. reading backlash and they're gonna see it so do they is that like, for instance, the SA, uh, the SS had, uh, you know, he, I can't remember which one it was, but it had the castle mm -hmm. for the SS mm -hmm. where they were performing rituals, rituals and yeah. everything else. Is this just the lead guy or is, or are they indoctrinating these people into that kind of cult? I think there's a certain amount of them that are. The hardcore believers mm -hmm. and then there's some others that say this is a good paycheck in a mm -hmm. crummy country where it's tough i don't want to be a security guard for a gas mm -hmm. station i want to use my skills and so i think there's a lot of wink wink oh yeah the, oh yeah nazis so mm -hmm. i don't think they're all they all follow this but the elite around wagner the head guy uh they are it is it is like a circle of these people so why are they so dangerous I, I think they are incredibly dangerous, number one, because of the ideology and anything goes. So this is all about serving the state and it's all about serving Putin. So it's almost like a Putin worship. In are place they, of Hitler, it is Putin now. Are they the ones who sliced? No, that sliced up the missing, uh, mm -hmm. that sliced up uh, one of the family members of the mm -hmm. terrorists who took the Russian diplomat. No, I don't know that that I was I was led to believe that this was more kind of I the on the intelligence side of stuff mixed with a little bit of special forces, but not the Wagner guys. So but I wasn't they'll there. slice them up in a meat slicer. Yeah. What will these guys do? What uh, won't uh, these guys do that they will? Well, uh, they, <laughs> there isn't much we've seen. It's because of these guys that Putin was able to take Crimea. They come in. They're very mm -hmm. smart. They foment rev revolution. So this is the this is the plan. This is why last summer's book, Spymaster, and my concern about Putin grabbing one of the smaller NATO states on the mm -hmm. Baltic, like Latvia, Lithuania, or Estonia. Mm -hmm. What these guys do is they come in where there's native Russian speakers, much the mm -hmm. way Hitler did in mm -hmm. Czechoslovakia. You rile everybody up, and then you come in saying, "Well, we're here to protect the ethnic Germans, or we're here Sudetenland. to Sudetenland." That, Student, exactly. That's what it was. Exactly. Except. Putin's on the, Russia's on the Security Council at the United Nations. So if they can go in and stir enough of this stuff up, and then the United Nations wants to send in peacekeepers, Putin can veto it, but say, here's what we will do. We don't think this is a UN problem. This is essentially a Russian problem. We'll send our own troops to keep peace there. It's a de facto invasion. And that's what I'm really worried about happening, because if Putin gets away with that, that's the end of NATO. If the U.S. does not go in, and I don't think we have the stomach to go in and back up Smaller NATO. I, I, I just don't think it's going to, I don't think it, it would happen. I don't think we'd honor the George Article 5. I think would have done it. He didn't move very quickly with, uh, with Georgia, mm -mm. and the Russians changed the borders there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, not a, and they, they weren't sufficiently scared off from, from the United States when Barack Obama came on the scene because they went even further, and they took the entire Crimean Peninsula. So Can we, can we change subjects? Sure. Talk, just, let's just talk about, let's sure. just talk about news of the day. Yeah. Okay. Donald Trump, mm -hmm. I've always said, I want a president with a twitchy eye. I want a president that keeps our, him guessing. Our enemies always go, I don't know. I think that SOB will do it. Yeah, like okay. they thought of Reagan. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. You have to be that cowboy that is like reaching for your gun and you're right. like, he'd be stupid to pull that gun out. Right. But he, he might just do might do it. Yeah. We should sit down and talk. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's what we have. Um, well, I never expected to get one with a twitchy eye where even the Americans were like, I don't know. He <laughs> just might do that. <laughs> what, do you, what do you take away from uh, Trump, the administration, and his relationship with Putin? What do you, what's, what do you think is happening there? <sighs> And I'm not talking about conspiracy stuff, and I'm oh, not talking yeah, about no. the election. I'm just talking about, what, what do you think is happening? So, first of all, Donald Trump got elected to go and be Donald Trump. Yes. Even though he said, I can be more presidential, mm -hmm. but it will be boring and all this kind of stuff. He was elected by our fellow citizens to be president. So, he is president, fair and square, no cheating, democratically elected, boom. Uh, I think 
he has a way that he does business. I think he has a comfortable. He is very much a. Do I like it? Do I not like it? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get. I'm not gonna read those briefing papers. I don't want to know about this. And I'm gonna mm -hmm. see. I'm gonna look him in the eye and see. Mm -hmm. You know, Bush said that about Putin. I looked into his eyes and mm -hmm. saw his soul, kind of a thing. Bush mm -hmm. tried to do the. Um, you know. You know the. Let my heart lead me. How we're gonna do right. this stuff. Um, I, I think that can be okay. But I think it needs to be, let's not pretend like this is 4D chess that's going on here. Trump goes with his gut. It's what he mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't some grand plan. And I think that we lose out a little bit by not having a more coordinated strategy behind the scenes. Uh, but we're, we were doing the same thing over and over again, for instance, with North Korea, which is sanctions, more sanctions, sanctions, more sanctions. Didn't get us anywhere. No He's talking to him. And if that does make a difference, it was Churchill that said, jaw, jaw is better than war, war. So, and that was the one thing Barack Obama apparently said to Donald Trump when they passed, you know, when the moving trucks passed at the, uh, mm -hmm. at the White House, he was most concerned with North Korea in their program. So Putin, though, is not a dummy. He's super, super, super smart. And if you see anyone on the world stage that is as smart and strategic as as Putin. As smart, but not as strategic. No. No. And he wants things. This is something I, I mentioned in Backlash, is that he wants all the benefits of civilized Western democracy, but he doesn't want to play by any of the rules. Correct. So he wants to do things his own way. And he, I mean, it's a, klep a kleptocracy over there, and it's a bunch of oligarchs that are raping that country. The Russian... Think about Russia's history pre-communism. Think of the artists that came from there, the composers, the mm -hmm. writers. These are people who love to read, that still mm -hmm. love to go to the ballet, that love music. Russia is an incredible country, but for its terrible government, the Russian people. But you get the government you deserve. If they don't have the stomach to overthrow these people, it's not our problem. We, we shouldn't be going around the world handing democracy on a silver platter to countries. Because if you don't fight for it, you won't be able to keep it. You don't value it. But Putin's dangerous. Putin's dangerous. Uh, I'm glad that there's certain foreign policy people around the president so that when Donald Trump goes and gladly shakes his hand, they can quickly count Trump's fingers and make sure he got all of his fingers mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I am concerned. I think they've been way too soft with Putin, way too soft with the Saudis, particularly with the whole Khashoggi thing. I think that's dangerous with the crown prince. Um, Is that any different than... The usual. I don't like being friends with the Saudis. Right. I think they're despicable. Mm -hmm. What they stand for, yada yada. I don't believe the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Um, it just doesn't. It never yeah. works out. Um, but we should show some moral condemnation for things like this. We shouldn't just say, "Well, he said maybe it's rogue people that did it." Right. He doesn't know what happened. That kind of stuff of taking these people. Putin says he didn't interfere with the election. I buy that. Even though my intelligence agencies, we need to stand <laughs> for more than just a great economy. America is more than just its economy. America is a set of ideas and principles. This is what's great about America. You can come from anywhere in the world and be an American. You can't come from anywhere in the world and be a Frenchman. You can't come from anywhere in the world and be Japanese. But here we subscribe to a set of ideas and values. And um, those are important. But, but do we? I mean, I think, I think our government hasn't subscribed to those values off and on throughout mm -hmm. our history. Um, but really, since the progressive era, we have just been sliding. I remember when they took and the American way out of right. Superman. Yeah, truth, okay. justice, and the American way. So it was just truth, justice, and we were like, uh, and the uh, American way. But wait, we have also now taken away truth. There is no truth yeah, anymore. Yeah, that's true. And justice is social justice. Uh -huh. There is no Superman's America anymore. They're all gone. All three of those are gone. If... Fine. You want to be out of the fight? You want to just give up? We can still fight, and we need to have a set of principles and values that we're willing to fight for. Uh, if you have not read George Will's new book on conservatism, I didn't know this story about Woodrow Wilson. Did you know that Woodrow Wilson, while you're, he was the... You're talking to me. You, I, yeah, I forget Woodrow. who I'm talking to. <laughs> no, I didn't know about the fight that Woodrow Wilson had at Princeton over where the graduate school should go. And he lost that fight. He wanted it on campus. He wanted the graduate students with the undergrads. And the person who headed the graduate school at Princeton said, no, there's this beautiful hill. It's a 15 minute walk away. That's where it should be. Woodrow Wilson was so ticked off, he resigned. That's why he left Princeton. He ran for governor of New Jersey that year. That started his 
that was that marked his entry into politics and he's the guy that really took on madisonian democracy had he won that fight had princeton put the graduate school where it was he might not have ever left we might have been a more madisonian republic madisonian democracy if not for that happening at princeton i thought that was a fat that's what george will opens his book on conservatism about and it's fascinating i'd say it's a great book and i know you're a big reader and mm-hmm. i i just got it for father's day uh and i have loved it but that was uh, all the times i've listened to you and woodrow wilson i never knew that story of why that. he went into politics yeah i didn't know that story yeah. i didn't know that story either um but while we're here uh speaking of woodrow wilson <laughs> one of the things he said was the job of education is to make a son the most unlike his father as possible. That's not good. We're there. Yeah. We're there. So what are the principles that you think we still hold? I, I want to clarify something. I think the coasts, and not all of the coasts, mm-hmm. the, the, the media centers, okay? Yeah. I think that kind of poison that toxic hatred stuff i think that's real and it's there i travel the country i talk to people nobody's talking about this stuff no. in their real life right they talk about it when they're watching television right or you're talking about a politician but nobody is talking about a hundred some genders they're right. not no, they're not doing it they're not okay so i'm not convinced we're as divided as we think we are however the universities are pumping out these these kids now that don't have any idea at all what the American Republic really is and what the American idea and the American experiment was all about. Mm-hmm. Have we lost that? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think we are finally starting to see the beginnings of a correction in the uh, marketplace uh, of higher education. I think the scandal of all these people buying their kids into school uh, has has put out there what's the value of an education. I, I have you know I'm a big fan of Mike Rowe, and I really think that one of the one of the bad things the American dream turned into was this idea that everybody's got to go to a four year college. I agree. You get people that spend a year or two there, realize it's not for them, they leave with a tremendous amount of debt. Vocational training is huge. We've, get, mm-hmm. we've, we've been handing out visas for nurses in the Philippines because we can't get enough people mm-hmm. here. We were looking in Eastern European uh, countries for electricians because we didn't have enough electricians here. So I think America is, is a place where there's going to always be the constant battle of ideas. You've mm-hmm. got the progressives, it and it should be. This is why we have checks and balances within, within our republic, and it exists in the cultural space as well. So I will never say die. I will never say we've lost this fight because the fight continues. I mean, I'm a Sonny Reagan optimist and I really believe America's best days are ahead of her, that we haven't hit our full potential, that there's so much coming. Uh, Jonah Goldberg's book, A Suicide of the West, was mm-hmm. fantastic. And Jonah talks about us being at the uh, the peak of the mountain right now. Mm-hmm. And we have to be really careful because if we lean too far one way or the other, we're going to topple off. This is the best moment in history, in the best country in the history of the world to be alive. We are so blessed to be here right now. And that's worth fighting for. And I want to fight for more than just a robust economy. I want to fight too. for those ideas and what it means to be a good neighbor. I, I, there's uh, Robert, I'm, I'm just completely throwing out all my favorite books, um, but uh, Putnam's book, Bowling Alone, uh, is a fascinating book, and he has a cocktail party gag or question he likes to ask, and I do it every time I'm out with people. What do you think was the invention of the 20th century that most served to isolate us from each other? Of uh, the 20th century, I would say that it is the Internet. You know what he says it is? Air conditioning. He said, we used to sit on the front stoop. True. Trying to catch a breeze. People would walk their babies. True. You would talk to your neighbors. True. Because it was too hot to sit inside. So do you know, um, you know about Epcot, what Epcot was supposed to be? Okay? Disney, yep. Experimental prototype city of tomorrow. Every front yard was facing a park. Okay. There was no street. There was no sidewalk. Your front stoop opened up into the park okay i didn't know that every home was built around the park and your backyards were very small it was you couldn't barbecue you weren't having picnics there you had nothing so he was trying to bring back that spirit of community Mm -hmm. 
where you would sit on the front porch, you would have the kids play, but you would be playing with your neighbors in the big backyard, whatever. And in the center, you would climb stairs and it would be a monorail system right directly into the city. So there was no, there was no traffic, no cars, nothing. <laughs> that is what we've missed. We don't... Um, you know, I talked to a taxi driver one time in New York City and he said, I said, and he was... 70 maybe at the time um and he had been driving since the 1950s and it was he was an amazing guy uh and i said how have what changes have you seen in this city and in people he said the change came in the late 60s he said we used to all just it would be hot we'd all bring our mattresses out and we'd sleep in the park. Wow. And he said we would either sleep on the fire escapes or many of us would go down and we would sleep in the park because it was too hot. We'd go out. Everybody was there. Everybody knew each other. He said, and that all ended in the 60s and the violence that started and the, and the, um, the, the serial killings and everything mm. else. He said, and we all kind of went in back into our homes. He said it hadn't been the same since. I agree. I agree. And we've now progressed from what will the neighbors think to not even knowing our neighbors' names. Mm -hmm. And that's a big difference, too, because those breaks on personal uh, behavior have come off. Uh, I have someone I work with, and she said if there was one thing from America's past she'd bring back, it'd be shame. This idea that shame on you. I remember that was the worst thing that an adult could say to me on public transportation. Mm -hmm. I, it was such a horrible thing mm -hmm. to have thought you've brought shame on yourself or your family. Um, but these aren't irreversible problems that America has. It, it really isn't. But I don't think there are solutions without first plugging back into what the values and principles of America you read Rudyard, are. You read Rudyard Kipling's uh, Gods of the Copybook Headings? No, and I should have because you did that great mm -hmm. commercial that freaked everybody out. Mm -hmm. I think it was for the Overton window, it was. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was such a powerful commercial. I remember mm -hmm. seeing that going, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> it, it's from Rudyard Kipling, and mm -hmm. he saw exactly what we're going through right now. He mm -hmm. saw it in his time. And he wrote this poem. It's hard to find because it's, it's, you, you don't, they, I mean, it's in one book that mm -hmm. I found. Uh, and I think that's intentional, burying him. Um, but he warns and he says, when all of these things happen, when you see them again, the gods of the copybook headings will limp back and mm -hmm. say it once more. As it was in the beginning, it'll be in the end. The dog returns to, to, its, her, vomit. to its vomit and the gods of the copybook headings with terror and slaughter will return. He says that he feels that once you go to a certain point where you are no longer recognizing truth, you won't be able to even understand truth or even know how to find truth until truth reinstates itself mm. and says, sorry, these things are always universally true. And because you deny them, you're in trouble. And trouble happens, you know, real trouble happens, World War I in his case. Uh, I like what Ben Shapiro says, facts don't care about your feelings. Yeah. It, truth is truth. And uh, I, I used to be, a, I used to make lots of jokes on Twitter. Uh, it's one of the things that I enjoyed about social media was the, the intelligence of people you could interact with. There's a lot of garbage on there, but I don't do it anymore. And I have a little uh, software program that deletes my tweets after two weeks because I don't want somebody coming back and saying three years from now, out of context, that I made some joke that if I had said it, like if I bumped into Stu mm -hmm. in the hallway and I gave him a big hug and somebody said, you two ought to get a room or some mm -hmm. silly thing and you didn't know the background. And I said, hey, Stu, I'm looking for rooms for you. You know, on Twitter, mm -hmm. it is so my own free speech, I feel, has succumbed to a, a, a ch there's been a chill. There's been a chilling effect on my my free speech because it is a. It is a slash and burn kind of a thing, and it is very dangerous, and that is part of the war on truth as well. People want to say black is white, and they – I understand now as an adult and as an author why uh, movements – come for the academics and the poets and the writers and the artists oh, yeah. first because we have a way of boiling things down and making it easy to understand. I mean, mm -hmm. you do it every day in all your programs and that makes you a threat to the storytellers and those with those with 
uh, a fixed star field on truth that is demanding evidence. If you say that's not the North Pole, show me the evidence. Right. You know, those people and the storytellers are the first to go. And uh, they are doing it. And not only are they doing it, but people are turning their backs on storytellers because they're allowing themselves to be siloed in Facebook, people getting all their news there. So they're not even listening to those storytellers. They found people that will lie to them 24-7 and tell them what they want to hear. So they found a way to kind of put wax in their ears so they're not even hearing truth anymore. And that is one of the dangers of the Internet. Are you following on the stuff that's happening with Google and their algorithms little little bit i actually sent you a message and i don't think you saw it i sent it uh late last night because we had talked about what books we would want to see preserved Mm -hmm. because of digital and what's happening microsoft is now shutting down its e-reader service you get your books until the end of 2019 and then it's just they're gone and I thought you'd really like reading that article, but it's, uh, you I'll, were really on to something is, is what I wanted it's, to say. It only makes sense. I mean, if we have all of our books digitally stored, I have all my Brad Thor books, mm-hmm. you fall out of favor. Gone. They're gone. Well, They're where are the gone. Little Rascals? I always heard this rumor that somebody had bought the rights to the Little Rascals programs because I never see them on TV anymore. Mm-hmm. I had heard this thing, and I never dug into it. I don't know, maybe I, because I grew up with them. I thought they were funny, but apparently somebody decided they weren't, and those are now gone. And we can have the discussion, and I, would, I saw them as a kid, so I can't argue for or yeah, against yeah, the yeah. Little Rascals. And I, I don't want this to explode into a Little Rascals thing. <laughs> Thor's pro, pro uh, Spanky, and everybody Wouldn't knows Spanky speak? was a monster. <laughs> he treated Darla like she was a piece of meat. Alfalfa was blah, blah, blah. I don't want to have that fight. How is it? How is it? How Appropriate would it be that you would flush your career down <laughs> over a, a little rascals? <laughs> Just a throwaway. Controversy, yeah. a cultural. You'd be like, and I was going to be someone, and <laughs> then I talked about those damn little rascals. <laughs> But it is scary that you could have your entire body of work just turned off. Gone. Just turned off. I mean, I, you could erase me easily. You'd take me off of radio. Mm -hmm. You could uh, take me off of YouTube. You could ban me from the internet, make me just an absolute pariah. Deplatform you, yeah. Deplatform me, get rid of my books digitally. Overnight, Mm -hmm. all of my work could be gone. Mm -hmm. And would anyone know that I even lived five years from now? Well, we've seen this, and I'm going I'm to jump right into Godwin's Law, which is never a good idea. But what are the Nazis like burning? They burn books, books for the same reason. They were trying to expunge certain ideas, certain people from So do you think, society? Brad, that there is, a, there is a fundamental flaw in humans? I mean, when you look at the Holocaust, the Holocaust happened, like, I think it's 25 times okay, throughout history. It's been going on forever. And, and you know, the... St- the star sewn to your clothes that's not the first time that happened that happened in persia 700 years ago and and little things just keep carrying on and you make the same mistake we look at the gestapo and we see the gestapo Mm -hmm. uniform and you're like holy cow well that was that was designed by hugo boss he Mm -hmm. was the designer of that uniform it, it wasn't designed to look scary. It was designed to look classy and snappy and buttoned up, okay? It was, if you take away what you know about the Nazis, I think most people would still say, that's a sharp uniform, okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But once you know what that uniform stands, stands for, then you're like, oh boy. Mm. So we have this part of us that doesn't recognize we just assume that evil's going to come with big black boots and a red armband. Wasn't that Jonah Goldberg's book, uh, Liberal Fascism? And I think yes. he was quoting George Carlin, saying that fascism will come with a smiley face. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And so we're not, we're not seeing things, or we refuse to, to recognize, yeah, I, I know that uh, it's unlikely that this is going to happen, you know, in America, but now in America, it's not so unlikely and it's not going to come looking the same way. They're burning books right now every time they take somebody offline and put them in a digital ghetto. It it is Francis Fukuyama who said history does not repeat 
but it does rhyme. Mm -hmm. So it means you have to be looking. You have to be willing to have the intellectual curiosity to say, is this, is this similar? And I grew up, I went to a, a largely Jewish high school in Chicago. Where, so my progressive liberal arts school, uh, I can't remember the breakdown, but the, the friends that I have now from high school that I know who are of the Jewish faith, I joke I've been to more high holidays than I have mm. to Christian holidays. Um, but I remember talking to parents and grandparents and how important it was not to forget, never forget, right? We, we talk about that all the time with the Holocaust because it can repeat. And Jewish people understand that it can come again. And that's why it is so important to preserve that piece of history. But it's also just as important not to forget it's also important not to let it happen, not to let those seeds grow. And that's what I am concerned with. If we can silence certain speech, then we're on a slippery slope. You're a fiction writer. Yes. Write the fictional story from where we are, uh, the, 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 the high points of how this ends in a good way and a bad way, and which one's more believable? So, particularly because of my friends growing up who were Jewish, I always wondered, how was it that the German population in the 1930s could be so physically and intellectually and economically intimidated into not necessarily supporting, they weren't all Nazis in Germany, mm -hmm. but boy, I think very quickly people shut up. There were some people that, you, like Bonhoeffer and things yeah, like this, yeah. that didn't. Have you read Defying Hitler? No. You have to read this okay. book. It, it, it's actually a a journal, uh, a diary of a guy that lived in, in Germany during the Weimar Republic okay. and saw Hitler come to power and was actually writing something to warn the West. Okay, mm -hmm. You don't know what you're dealing with right. here. You don't know what's right. happened to the German people. And he goes through it and you see it in a completely different way. You all of a sudden answer that question because I've wondered that mm -hmm. my whole life. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Yeah. And Brad, when you read it, put World War II instead of World, or World War One mm -hmm. instead of World War One, just replace that with the World Trade Center. Yeah, and it's all coming this way. It's it's there. Well, then, so what we see is there were very likely everyday Germans in the streets saying were. these Nazis are idiots. Crazy. We don't want this. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden there's bricks through their windows. There oh, are burning stores and they put, don't they, hire these people like you right, see on Twitter. Right. It's not enough to disagree with someone on social media you anymore. You have to destroy them. I've had people get pissed to. with me and they always want to tag my publisher in everything. Right. What do you care? Yeah. Just ignore me. Right. I'm one voice. Ignore right. me. You don't like what I have to say, right. but you're supposed to, I'm supposed to lose everything and because you salt the earth. If you, if we, what they, they did do the bricks through the windows, but the more effective thing was the SA. And the SA, the brown shirts, marching down. And at the beginning, people didn't say Heil Hitler mm -hmm. because they chose to. It's because the SA was in public and they would beat, they would go oh, down. If you and didn't, take, oh, yeah. They'd take over a street. Yep. And if you didn't, they would stop and they would beat that person until everybody did. And the U.S. media kept it secret, kept, yes. they refused to report on it. If you read Eric Larson's fabulous book, In the Garden of Beasts, oh, it's great. It, is, it is one of the most perfect books there is in a single, there's no typos, there's no yeah, grammatical, it's, it's it is fantastic. so, and I've become friends with Eric, and I've told him, I love that book. Please tell him, I talked about that book every day for almost two years, trying to get this, the people on my staff to read that yeah. book. It is Fantastic. It, and it reads like a thriller. Yeah, it, it is it, so good. How he puts things together. Yeah. But, it, and that's exactly, you're right. I didn't know about that until I'd read his book about how there were people that wouldn't, it, one of my favorite pictures on the internet is all of these, all these Germans saluting, and the one, the one guy's like this, and they got a circle saying, be this guy. Be this guy. And I love that. That's who I want to be. But yeah, the story, yeah. <laughs> but, but I want to change alive. the ending. Yeah. Be that guy alive. Be that guy alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it is it is great to see you again. It's great, great to, to see you too. To what is what is the next book? What are you gonna take on next? I don't know. I really don't know. It's having just gotten back from visiting Hemingway's house. This is such an arrogant thing to say to compare yourself to even say I walked mm -hmm. in the rooms of Hemingway's house. 
I looked at what drove his style, what he learned in newspaper work for short, powerful sentences. Uh, I, I never read To Have and Have Not, and I'm reading it now, and it's fascinating about a man who kind of is losing everything and has to turn to crime to support his family and sm uh, run smuggling back and forth with Cuba. Um, I don't know. I have a, a deep, deep desire as an artist to, to maybe do a couple of one-offs that are, are a little different. Uh, I'm going to turn mm. I'm going to turn 50 in I think it's like two months from today. We're getting really close. Wow. So I, I, I have a major milestone in my life and I want to spend at least the next two years uh, adding to what I've already done with the Scott Harvest stuff, continuing to make my fans happy. But to stretch myself and go further with different things. And so can you write two books? At a I time? did it one year when I did my all female Delta Force team, the Athena project. Mm -hmm. I did really two good. books. But walking around Hemingway's and I joked with you earlier that, you know, we talk about how much we write in a day and Hemingway mm -hmm. did five to seven hundred words. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing it just for myself, maybe I don't even consider it for publication. It doesn't have to be a hundred thousand word book. There may be another way I do. I've got friends that have been begging me to do graphic novels with them. They love graphic novels. There's lots of little things we can potentially do, but I want to stretch myself as a as a writer. I want to do more. I love Scott Harvath. He's not going anywhere. I promise. He's he's going to be around for a long time. But I'd love to do some more stuff in the genre. I've got a really cool idea uh, that actually takes one of the stories from the Bible and puts a major spin on it, drops it in the CIA that I think would be oh, wow. so current. And you'd read this and not have any idea until the end. Oh, my gosh, I know that story. Mm. But it's told in such a way that it's all of the same things play out. It, that's the one I'm most excited about. And I feel like I have to do it. I have to do it. Not because I want to promote the Bible or anything, but I just think it's one of the greatest stories ever told. And I think dropping it into the CIA with spies and all this stuff could be so cool. So I have always been, uh, do you remember how we met? Oh, I don't either. Yes, I do. I do. Oh, okay. So you had a newsletter you were doing and you came up with this idea that you were going to serialize a thriller and you were going to have a thriller writer that? each month. All right, I think it was, was it weekly or monthly? I think monthly. It was monthly. Each month, a thriller writer would take over and take the next chapter. Yeah. We still have that. We just oh. haven't finished it. And you had me on the radio because you yeah. loved what I wrote about yeah, You're like, yeah, wait yeah. a second, is yeah. this true? Does this place exist? Yeah. Did the U.S. government build mm -hmm. this facility? And we came on the radio and we, it was like a house on mm -hmm. fire. We got along and that was the beginning. Wow. Okay. So um, uh, I've, always loved, I've always loved talking to you because you write faction, mm -hmm. you know, and you can't write a good novel Truth is uh, stranger than fiction because fiction has to make sense. Mark Twain, that's what he said. So yep. uh, you have to write things that people go, mm, I can see that happening. Yeah. Okay. Literally a UFO could come down today and, and people would be like, well, that's it. Yeah. It doesn't have to make sense. We see it. Yeah. There it is. And nobody is willing to think out of the box except for thriller writers. And that's why I got invited to participate in the Red Cell unit at the right. Department of Homeland Security. Correct. Help the government think three, four, five, six steps ahead of the bad guys. So think ahead. Mm -hmm. I had a guest on uh, a couple of weeks ago that was very, I can't say he's a pot. Can't say he's a positive guy. Um, uh, kind of a miserable guy okay. in his own life, but um, you know, uh, doesn't wish anybody harm and just a happy, you know, kind of go lucky guy. And he said, "I think, I think we're headed towards war. I can't think." He said, "It is now no cartilage; it's bone on bone." Oof. And um, I don't. I hope not. I don't think we're there yet. Uh, I hope we never get there, but play this out. What, what are you concerned about? What are you seeing as the things that are happening right now that are really concerning that we have to address as people, not a government? Okay. Um, so one of my big concerns is you can walk into a bar 
And there's going to be a very big guy in the bar, bigger than you, bigger than me. And that's the guy I'm worried about because he's bigger and he could he could put a big hurt on me. But that doesn't mean there's nobody else in the bar that could also mm-hmm. put an equal or worse mm-hmm. hurt on you. So I'm concerned about Russia, China, North Korea, the Iranians. I'm concerned about all that. There is right now with uh, the 5G technology, it's a fascinating race for this stuff. Um, the Russians have a really crappy version of it that they're mm-hmm. working on. Chinese is better. Uh, President Trump has a lot of pressure on him to allow Huawei to come back in. China wants to use it as a as a leverage thing. What's interesting is to watch the Russians don't want us to get the technology ourselves. And if uh, I, I, I laugh, uh, I've been asked to be on a couple of channels that I'll never go on. Russia Today is one of them. Mm-hmm. I would never go on Al Jazeera. I mean, these are prop- propaganda mm-hmm. outfits. I'm not going to do it. But the Kremlin has been putting stories into Russia today up to scare Americans. 5G causes cancer. Mm-hmm. 5G causes birth defects because they want to create a, gra- a grassroots movement against 5G in the United States so that the Americans, so that we could be left behind. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's insane, but it works. There are Five, some people that listen to this and believe it. 5G is uh, probably the equivalent of our moonshot. It's going to be that important mm-hmm. on who controls it in china uh if contr- if china controls that pipeline everything is theirs it's, it's everything is everything theirs. It, it, it is over it is something we can i first of all i'm surprised that we find ourselves in this situation I as am, a nature I am too. as a nation i'm stunned i'm stunned and, but we absolutely we have we've got some catching up to do but we cannot take this tech from the chinese we can't we, we cannot be at there. It's bad enough that we had all these microchips that were going into weapon systems and everything from the Chinese. I don't know where people are, where their minds are, that, that we would allow. I mean, China's not an ally. We've got to be very concerned about anything that touches our technology that the Chinese have fingerprints on. Uh, they, from a geostrategic standpoint, they're the ones that I'm most worried about because I think they're the, they're the cleverest, they're the most devious. They've got enough money and enough brain power in China to really put the hurt on us, uh, to back us into a corner, and to have already thought out and war-gamed the six or seven different ways we might go. I mean, the Chinese are not thinking day-to-day. They're thinking century-to-century. Century. Yeah, they're playing go. Yeah, they're we playing go. Be, not, we're, yeah, we're playing hungry, hungry hippos, yeah, and, and they're, they're playing, playing go. go. Um, how do you think Trump is handling uh, China? You know, these tariffs, I'm against tariffs. I'm not a tariff guy either. Right. But when it comes to China, Huawei, that was that. I, I read that, that he put Huawei on, uh, on the list of no technology coming in, and they I, were speaking truth about Huawei. Mm-hmm. That's the first time I've, I've seen something like that, and I went, Absolutely. Best move. They need to make. stick with it, though. It can't be a negotiating. It tactic. cannot be a negotiating tactic. We cannot allow allow Huawei in this country. We, we shouldn't be doing any business with NATO them. NATO shouldn't be doing. No, business with no. Them. You know, this is this is the problem with tech. You see you see Turkey, which is a NATO member. I, Thinking about taking a Russian missile system, mm-hmm. I believe it's the S-400, and this is a problem because then they bring Russians in to run it, and now the Russians get to see all of our stuff. and how it, So we're saying then you don't get the, the planes. The China is, is not a friend of ours. They are not a good actor. Uh, they, they steal every piece of technology that we have. Uh, so I'm... I'm Cautiously optimistic. I'm hoping that the Huawei thing and the 5G from China stays out of the United States. But but we'll see. The president. It, this is. It's easy for us to kind of black and white these things. Mm-hmm. But this is what Madison talked about when Madison uh, in the Federalist Papers. When Madison was talking about the need, particularly for the Senate. Uh, it, it, he, he talked about in Federalist 10 factions, and he also talked about the need for, for a Senate in Federalist 63 and what was important for senators and all politicians to do. It is important for politicians to communicate with the masses, to say, I understand this is what you want. You want to vote for this. This is a need or a desire that you have as a citizen of the republic. Great. I put that in this hand, and in this hand... I have the actual concept, the republic, and we have to figure out how these two things go together. It's not just about whatever the voters vote for, they get. There is a custodianship uh, of the overall community of of the United States, the republic, that has to be balanced in there. And you don't see many politicians 
explaining how the government works to the people in the United States. It's one of the things I've always liked about Rand Paul. He's very conversant, very, very fluent mm -hmm. in the language of America and the founding documents and all this stuff. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a tough balancing act. So when we talk black and white, Huawei, that kind of a thing, there's a lot more on President Trump's plate than just Huawei. And he's yes. got things he wants to accomplish, and he has a reelection coming up, and he knows there are things important to his base. He knows he wants to turn out the base. He knows there's key states he's got to win. So this stuff doesn't happen in a in a vacuum. And it's very difficult for any politician, right or left, I would imagine, to juggle and balance it all. So let's go back and look at uh, American companies, mm -hmm. because I think Google and Facebook are just as frightening, if not more so, than Huawei and anything the Chinese have at us. Uh, first of all, they'll work with the Chinese. They'll censor mm -hmm. people in China. In China yet yeah. they are so you know highfalutin that they say that oh, the, they're the arbiter of what's right and wrong. You're currently helping the government of China monitor on its own yeah. slaves and and people. Um, it's it's not good. Have you read? Do you ever read any Arthur Herman? No, I have not. He's a historian. He is one of my favorite. Uh, writers of, of history. Um, he wrote Freedom's Forge. Um, and Freedom's Forge is about how the, how FDR blew off everything and nobody wanted to go to war. Mm -hmm. you know, we're in that situation now. Yeah. Nobody's going to want to go to war. So nobody wanted to go to war and he wouldn't prepare, wouldn't prepare, and it got mm -hmm. worse and worse and worse. Until at the very end, uh, about 19, I think, 39, early 1940, um, he went to the president of GM, who he had been calling names, saying you're horrible, saying you're an ugly capitalist, and blah, blah, blah. He went to him and called him and said, I need to speak with you in the, in the Oval and, uh, this week. Can you come? Uh, that Sunday preceding, uh, Herman, I mean, um, uh, this guy came, went, I can't remember his name now, went to his family and sat down at the dinner table and said, the president wants me to come. And everyone at the dinner table said, you're not going are you? And he said, he's the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but dad, he's tried to destroy you and our family. He's the president of the United States. I will listen to him. Brought him in, said, listen, Germans, we're probably going to go to war. Mm -hmm. Germans have a war machine. We're not going to be able to, to develop. Um, you are one of the best guys strategically on how to operate plants. So would you build our war machine? Okay. It's a fascinating story. It just a like fantastic it. story. Um, Arthur was just asked by the Pentagon, could you come in and speak to this? If today we needed that, would these yeah. companies do it? Yeah. He said, no. He said, your big companies like Google and Facebook, they're beyond America. They're beyond uh, the United States government, and they're not necessarily on our side. They're not looking at America as this place that gave them the freedom to right. create. Do you think what you watch and see, do you think that Google, Facebook are the type push comes to shove? They put their resources in America? It is so hard for me. This is a really interesting discussion we're having now in the country because I believe that the government that governs least governs best. Mm -hmm. So I don't like government telling businesses what to do. That's just my natural reflex. Uh, but we did break up uh, monopolies, uh, the railroad barons, the steel barons, things like this. So there were there were monopolies where we said this is unfair mm -hmm. competition. Um as it's someone who is, I call myself a conservatarian, I'm very conservative uh, fiscally, and then I want the government out of my life pretty much everywhere else. Not everywhere, but pretty much everywhere else. It is, uh, it's tough because government always lags technology. Legislation always lags technology by several years at, at the best. So this idea of what do we do with Google, uh, what you asked, did I think Google and Facebook would actually participate in a, in a war machine on behalf of the United States kind of a thing? If push comes to shove and America and our ideals are on the ropes and it is China, it's Russia, the rest of the world, um, 
Do they? I, I think if they have business interests in other countries, I think they will claim a Swiss style neutrality. They're, they're going to BS their way through it. Yeah, there's 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 an interesting thing in my book, Blacklist, which I did about total information awareness and the kind of the total surveillance state, the stuff that uh, Frank Church warned us about that if the giant listing years of the NSA were ever turned inward, that would be a surveillance Rubicon we would not be able to cross back over. And that's exactly what happened after 9-11. Started listening, gathering the metadata and all this kind of stuff. As I researched that book, I found out about early versions of the computer, particularly IBM, what would go on to become IBM technology that actually improved the lethality of the Holocaust for the Germans. IBM and the Holocaust. Yeah, I, great back. book. And actually, it was somebody on your staff that recommended it, the IBM mm -hmm. and the Holocaust when I said I'm writing this book about, you know, kind of the roots of technology being used for evil. So mm -hmm. that sits in my library in my office because of your staff. Um, so I am concerned that the play from a Google or Facebook would be, you know what, we kind of just want to stay out of this. No matter how we saw this with Apple. In the wake of the terrorist shootings in California, remember that couple went into that Christmas party and the FBI had the, the shooter's phone and Apple refused to unlock it. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Mm -hmm. We didn't know if he had more attacks, who his co-conspirators mm -hmm. were, could we gather up people? And Apple said, no, we're not going to open, we're not going to open that phone. Now, I don't necessarily know that that really was what was needed on the other end of things, whether it was the NSA or whatever, that they might have just put up a good fight just to make people think they couldn't crack the phone. Right. The Brits were exploiting a backdoor on iTunes for the longest time to get into people's computers. So, uh, But no, I, I, I find it hard to believe that companies like Google, I've always joked about Google, when your mascot is a T-Rex and your, and your uh, motto is don't be evil, there's some yeah, sort of a, a disconnect. It's, correct. it's not correct. working there. So I'd like to think that they would do the right thing. I try to look for the best in people and even uh, big companies, uh, just because I, I like the way America works. I, I think it's really hard to... Um, to uh, to be evil and not face some sort of a backlash. But what you'll find is we're so balkanized in this country. So there'll be people that don't want to go to war. So they're going to lean on Facebook. Don't cooperate with the government. And that'll only add fuel to Facebook wanting to cover its bottom line if it's going to tick off other countries. So I think they'd, I think they'd make a very compelling case to stay out of it. I don't think they would uh, hop right in and help us. Uh, and you're right. I think they're kind of, uh, what is it? What's the correct term? I'm the author. Uh, supranational. Uh, I mean, they really are above the nation state, as it were. And this was something you and I talked about this a decade ago. What's going to happen when you have these companies that have offices and money all over the place and suddenly they're not loyal to a, a, a particular country? And they are loyal to us only as a product. Yeah. Well, if it's free, you're the product. Mm -hmm. And that's a great saying. And it's... Uh the information that they can get. Now the, the latest is um, they say they'll be able to collect more information on who you are, what you actually believe, what you actually think, the minute we start wearing glasses. The Google Glass thing, should track the eye movement and... Track the eye movement, yeah. that focal point in the eye, that 5% yeah. that really can tell you everything about a person. Um, and if you read anything about Bezos and what Bezos is trying to do and what Google is trying to do right now with information is they're, they're more interested in leading than following and um, trying to find out all exactly the information to, in Bezos' case, I think to serve you, but it's a spooky line, uh, in, in Google's place to be able to train you to be able to get you to move the way they want. It's Cass Sus Sus Sustine's yeah. uh, book, Nudge, on steroids. And that's the end of individualism. Yes. In our republic, if you start even online changing the way you do things or what you say online, that's it. it. This republic was set up, was founded to protect the greatest minority group in the world, the individual. But when we start changing how we think, what we look at, all of this kind of thing, these, the, the, that's the essence of what makes you human is how you think. That is, that is where the individual lies. That's where the soul lies. And if they're going to start manipulating and tracking this and all that kind of stuff, that's... That's some, I don't like the tech we have now. I don't have an Alexa in my house because I don't want oh, anybody yeah. listening in, no. uh, in. And yet we're still doing it. 
Oh, it, it, my my we uh, under Obama they talked about the smart grid and there was this idea of smart appliances mm -hmm. and you have That's your coming. you have your loyalty card at the grocery store. Well, if you have uh, national health care and you have a smart refrigerator that's tied into the internet and you have barcodes on all your like on your ice cream at some point if the government's responsible for your health care it's going to monitor at what point three in the morning a, this amount of ice cream was raised off the shelf because the sensor triggered some reader inside and when it came back this much ice cream was missing so we know, Glenn, that you were up at two in the morning having some Rocky Road or whatever it was. And We've already seen this with cars. Uh, car insurance. Yeah. We're giving you a car insurance. But if you step on your brake too fast, your char car insurance is going to go up. Right. So, and it's hard to argue because you're like, well, they are paying for the insurance for this car. And if I'm being reckless, they should know. But it's... Uh, it, but that's voluntary when you put the chip in there. At what yeah. point does it happen? You know, I've been worried that eventually the government is going to demand some sort of kind of black box in cars, that this has really gotten to be a problem, traffic accidents, mm -hmm. and you, we, we waste so much money in court or insurance companies pay out too much money. So we're going to mandate that if you want, and now you've got a constant, you, we see it now, right, with the with the cameras and stuff that yeah. Uber drivers and yeah. things like that have. Mm -hmm. So, um yeah, the Brookings Institute did a study uh, several years ago. Where they, what they found was they, they didn't study the U.S. government, but they studied governments around the world. And what they found was that as the cost of data storage comes down, surveillance by the state of citizens goes up. And what does that give them? It gives them a, a time machine. They can go back and build a case. Mm -hmm. Gosh, we can't get Glenn Beck off the air. Well, you know what? There's all these security cameras around his house. Let's see if Glenn speeds. Let's see if let's see if Brad Thor walked out of this bar and got in his car, and we can get the footage. Or it, well, how about this, um, Alex Jones? The story was circulated about Alex Jones with child porn. Mm. Okay, that he allegedly sent it to the Sandy Hook parents or something like right. that. Right, and yeah. when the story actually is, people sent him uh, porn, uh, and if he would have opened it. They would know yeah. he never opened it and never forwarded it to anyone, I think, except for the FBI. And that story now is that he was sending porn, child porn. This makes no sense. Why would you Sandy do that? Hook. Why would you do why that? Why would you do that? Why would you ruin your career? Correct. Why would you give the people that are out to get you? Why would you child be airdropping uh, some of the worst ammunition into their front yards? That but you everybody looks at that story and says, that's Alex Jones. Yeah, of course. Well, he's done that. I mean, there is there a worse thing to accuse somebody of? No, of being it's, a pedo it, no it, it's horrible. It's it, but it just goes to show you we can't trust the sources of information, all of them that we get. We really have to do our own homework. I just had a friend in from Hong Kong who is a trade commissioner to Hong Kong for a European country. He's been a friend of mine since grade school. And he said, you, I was asking about all the riots in the streets in Hong Kong about this extradition thing. And he goes, oh, Thank God I'm here to set you straight. He said, we don't have any extradition. He said, you remember the story, Brad, about the guy who killed his girlfriend and put her in a suitcase like in Malaysia or something? I said, yeah. He goes, that guy's walking around in Hong Kong because we don't have an extradition treaty with them. He said, the media has made this all into, he said, I'm all for democracy. I love democracy. He said, I believe in it. He said, there's a reason I live in Hong Kong because my country in Europe will put me in jail if I say something about a protected group. I can't even speak my mind about the immigration crisis, whatever. I could lose my job and everything. And he said, but you need to know that, particularly when you're getting your stories in the U.S. from overseas, they are absolutely being shaped to fit a narrative back here. And I said, well, wait a second. So what happens? He said, Brad, we've got about 14 or 15 cases of people who are very likely murderers who are in Hong Kong that can't get kicked out because these extradition treaties don't exist. But he said there are groups that are getting people into the streets. They're paying money to get them out there. They're trying to make this about a democracy thing. He said, and sure, would somebody who committed an act in mainland China be potentially extradited and all this? Yeah. But so would somebody who like a Snowden. Remember, where did Snowden run to first? He ran to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. He ran to Hong Kong, and then magically the Russians said to the Chinese, we'll take him off your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Give him a nice little DACA on the lake. Oh, yeah. good. It's oh, all, good. All circles within wheels. Brad, thank you. Appreciate it. Good to it. see you. Glad to see you. Thank you.